Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me here. I think I'm loud enough that you can hear me, which is good. Uh, so my name is Elizabeth Alexander. Most people that know me well call me Liz. Um, but I actually kind of think of Elizabeth Alexander as this sort of alter ego, much more feminine, much more um, uh, person that's a lot more conscious of the social expectations, societal expectations. And a lot of this work, I feel like could not have come from a Liz. It comes from an Elizabeth, you know. Um, and uh, my statement has me say that I'm a domestic archaeologist and you know, what on earth could that mean? And um, hopefully I'll kind of explain a little bit about that to you, you know, sort of like um, sifting through these sort of like expectations of daily life and, and what that is and how that feels at different stages of your life and to different types of people. Um, so, ooh, this is a very reactive remote. So um, my father is, uh, has his own steel fabrication business and has my entire life. And my mother, you know, was, uh, her main occupation was to take care of us, but um, she was his girl Friday. So I was at his shop all the time. I basically grew up in a welder's shop. And um, I would, you know, when I didn't have my own activities to do, when I was bored and I was stuck in his shop all day, I really loved pouring over these books um, from the King Architectural Metals catalog, which is a catalog just of decorative, uh, you know, decorative steel that you can buy to make your railings have a little more flair. And, um, you know, a lot of Victorian, Baroque, um, Edwardian kind of designs. And I liked them because when I was, you know, little, I, they were very similar to what you'd see maybe in fairy tales or princess castles and things like that. So I really loved those designs. Um, and when I grew up, grew up. <laughs> when, I, when I was old, you know, older, out of school, I actually became a steel fabricator myself. And so I was working for um, construction worker welders and as well as other artists fabricating for them. And it was very hard for me um, to not be very hyper aware of feeling very alien and in a place that I should have felt very comfortable in because I grew up in that environment, but I was the only woman in those spaces doing that work. And sort of what that felt like, um, feeling like you really stand out for kind of no reason. And um, so I made this series of welding um, sort of artifacts uh, called Welder's Daughter. And I made these decorative welding um, sort of objects, you know, so the helmets, the safety equipment, the tools that you use, things like that, out of paper and other kind of delicate materials um, that were highly decorated so that you would, um, excuse me, that you, so that you would see, uh, so you could tell that there was a utilitarian object in there, but they weren't utilitarian because they were so encrusted with, with things. So this is a welding helmet made out of paper and graphite. This is a hammer covered in paper. And then the paper was actually cut away to sort of have these flowers growing on the hammer. And the great thing about this process was that the paper actually rusted, so I could, it was almost like printmaking. You can kind of see, it's got a laser pointer. You can see that there's um, sort of text and textures and things. And so there's always a surprise, you know. So I have this conceptual goal, this narrative that I'm thinking about, but I also really like when I'm working to have to sort of have a dialogue with the materials and really collaborate with the materials and not know exactly what's going to happen when I'm working all the time, you know? So there's a sort of sense of surprise and not being able to fully predict what the outcome will be. Um, so this is a welding leathers that I laser cut to sort of look like a kimono, to have this sort of lace pattern. This is a close up non-paper item, but I also did altered welding uh, equipment and materials. Um, uh, another piece I did along those lines was called Fabricator's Banquet, which I was invited to do inst an installation at two different colonial houses, and I really love working in um, unusual spaces because I get to sort of collaborate with the space and research the space. So I was researching what might be um, sort of interesting and in that location that might look like it belonged there but not fully obviously because it's contemporary paper sculpture but um, so I researched lace and may and um, 
and sort of the types of food that would be really, uh, that would be really um, sort of eaten by upper class people. So fr fresh fruit and um, game, and I have sausages also in there. And all of the objects are made out of lace that was um, made from the patterns of railings. So it's the products of that kind of, you know, that, that sort of working class uh, occupation. Uh, another sort of piece along that vein is upward mobility, which is a Pontiac Firebird from 1993 that was completely undrivable that I, instead of fixing it, turned it into a kind of chariot, but that you can't use because there's no wheels or anything. There's wheels around plinths. Uh, and so I, I had a lot of fun sort of researching interiors and, and kind of decking it out, but um, the sort of humor in it and the absurdity in it is that instead of fixing the car so you could use the car, and it was the language of this sort of um, shell of a car that you'd find on blocks in somebody's backyard, you know, so you can't use the car, it's still on blocks, but it has all this gold and all this stuff. So it's like almost like putting makeup on something, you know, it's covering up really what's going on. It's not fixing the thing, but it's like overcompensating for it being broken in a very unusual way. Um, so here's just an image of the types of spaces I, uh, I research. And, you know, it's probably no secret that I love Victorian, Edwardian, Baroque interiors. I grew up in New England. I'm just came from Boston this morning. I live uh, in Winston-Salem now, but um, you know, going to the Newport mansions on school field trips and all of these um, places that have this type of interior. And the funny thing about it that I really love is this was all built at the time by new money, people that were just got you know wealthy from the Industrial Revolution or um, playing the stock market and winning big or whatever. And so, or people that came from Europe to start a new life. But a lot of it was people that were trying to prove to the European aristocracy that they were just like them, that they could you know, measure up. And so they were using their architects and building their buildings. And the Europeans thought that it was total garbage and tacky and horrible. But these, this is still, even though you know, it's antiquated symbols of wealth, it's still a symbol of that kind of um, that prosperity. You know, sort of an, the utmost American dream is going, coming from nothing and then using European uh, architects to build your palace, right? Um, so to so the work in this show, this is the series here, Bell and Grath Gardens and Home. And this I made while I was uh, laid up and uh, sick with pneumonia in graduate school. So I was completely useless. I couldn't do any of my work. I was too type A to just have R&R &R and sit and watch TV all the time and be sick. So I um, wound up giving myself a, uh, an assignment, and I had this book of, called The Bell and Grath Gardens and Home, which is the title of the work. It's the title of the book. And I took the entire book of formal gardens in Alabama. Um, so it's a formal gardens in a state probably considered by the European aristocracy to be a very tacky thing in Alabama, but um, beautiful formal gardens. And I removed all the flowers from the whole book. So I just asked myself one question. I said, what would happen if I took the purpose of these spaces out of the space? You know, the former gardens are there to house all these flowers. And so I took all the flowers out. What happens to the space? And it becomes this very surreal, ethereal, kind of layered environment that's really odd. You know, you can't really tell if it's disappearing, if it's materializing, um, if it's compressed or if it's, you know, expanded, you know, it's got this really strange presence. And this piece, when I was sick in grad school, was my major breakthrough turning point work. You know, I was the thing that I figured out, wow, I really love taking, you know, affecting material or objects by doing just one thing taking something away, but consistently just that one thing throughout the whole material, and then applying it to something else. So, you know, these have all these voids, 
and then when the, you compress all the flowers, that's a totally different thing. It becomes this really kind of almost like a nuclear landscape. You know, it has this just very acidic kind of quality from the just compressed color and pattern. Um, so that is really what sparked all of this work in here. Um, so it's all either simulated spaces or talks about spaces. Um, I'll get back to her. <laughs> or, um, where I take the patterns out and then repurpose it into something else. So this series and a few of the pieces in here have kind of stemmed from this series or started there. It's called Keeping Up Appearances, which is her. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with the show. It's on the BBC. Um, it's called Keeping Up Appearances. And this woman is named Hyacinth Bucket, but she calls herself Hyacinth Bouquet. And her neighbors all think she's ridiculous because she does things like puts out all the high society magazines and has the best china and make sure you know that it's the best china and she'll come to your house and make sure that you see that she has a hot, you know some important person coming over and so it's just she like takes great lengths goes to great lengths to make sure that you know how important she is and nobody cares everyone thinks she's just nuts and so um, I really like that kind of keeping up, like this sort of extreme version of keeping up with the Joneses or trying to keep up with societal expectations, societal norms. And a lot of this is the theme through a lot of my work is just sort of like figuring that out as an adult, growing adults. Like, what, what is this that we're supposed to be doing? And, um, but also sort of taking it to the utmost extreme and seeing the absurdity in it. Um, and it's in some ways, you know, it talks a lot about um, perfectionism, like hyper-perfectionism, or maybe fixing things in the wrong way, you know, maybe you're not taking care of the real problem. And, um, but this was the first iteration of the series, actually photographed by Lisa Walcott, who was a visiting artist last year, um, where I took apart this room and then sort of like in a series of images turned it into this rug. But what I really like about it is you don't know what's happening over here. Am I going to take the rug apart and turn it into something else? Or am I starting to build a new room? But it's this sort of like cycle of you know, time, you know, things being affected by time, somebody just obsessively fixing a room that doesn't need to really be fixed, uh, and really kind of ruining everything in the process. <laughs> so um, you know, it, it's, this, it's an aesthetic way of kind of talking about a lot of those things that go on up there, that being self-conscious or trying to like over-perfect everything around you. Um, so here's a close-up of the rug of the final panel. Um, and you'll see that this tea set eventually shows up again. And I don't know if any of you have noticed the china um, behind this wall. But uh, you know, things kind of come in and come out really directly from this series. This has sound, but for the purposes of time, I'm not going to play it. But I often collaborate with my husband when I do these installations. He does a sound component. So if you go to my website, you can hear it. Uh, uh, it's very lovely. It's too bad I can't play it. But um, this was a similar installation, Keeping Up Appearances, where I just used the wallpaper. And that's actually what I'm doing now, is I'm, instead of having you know, the chair, actually, I shouldn't say that. I'm doing it again. But and for this, the later Keeping Up Appearances, I just used the wallpaper to rebuild these things. And, I actually use the same material. I build upon it, but I reorganize it in ways so you can't tell that it's the exact same material and, and pieces in each iteration. So um, you know, you probably noticed this guy. He's over there, the chandelier. The rug used to be on the floor, and now it's on the wall. You know, and I, I really like kind of playing with either the space and changing things based on the space, trying to make sure everything looks like it's supposed to live there. When I actually installed this, the gallery director did not know that that wainscot was not part of the, the gallery. He thought that that was what I built that, and I built all of this. He thought it was all there. So I do a lot of really making sure that I research the space, and I'll be doing that at Sika, and so everything really looks like it lives there. You know, I did that also with the, um, the Colonial Mansion uh, to make sure that it doesn't look awkward because when you're, I didn't want it to look like a showroom. You know, it's really dangerous when you're setting these things up. It looks like a staged, it's very staged already. So you want to make sure it doesn't look completely artificial. It sort of looks like it belongs where it is. <clears throat> and uh, this is the 
we, we would call it the cow, but I, because uh, it has it has a sort of weird animal quality to it. Um, so this is a more abstracted version of these wallpaper pieces, where I was thinking about how to build a, a house without actually building a house or a room without building a room. So how do you represent the house without it really being in there? And um, so I actually built it with all these materials that you would build a house with. And I made, it had all these like weird things to code in there that I know from construction. But it's got roofing tar and two by fours and drywall and insulation and all these things. And then, um, and it's called rot, like wrought iron. But it's, I was really thinking about, instead of representing just like a literal room, I was t thinking more about representing time. So, you know, like, so on this side, it looks like things are growing, and then the other side, it looks like things are dying. So just like those, those collages, you don't really know where things are going. They could be becoming overgrown, which everything in the South seems to love to do that. <laughs> or you don't know if it's all about to turn black on you and, and it's all dying. So I, I really like that kind of moment where you, you're catching something in flux. And, uh, and you don't really know what's going to happen to the thing. You don't need those details. You can see it live. Uh, and then finally, recently, I've been doing these more flat, kind of almost formal wallpaper pieces. And again, it's just like the installations where I take all the pattern out, and then I put it down into assemblages. And it's having this kind of funky puzzle for myself where I don't really um, know what the pattern's going to look like when it's all together. You know, I don't actually, you know, I choose the pattern because it has certain shapes and certain colors and things like that, but I don't know how it's going to actually play off of each other because you can't isolate a leaf and put it against another leaf to really see it until you actually cut it out and put them together. So it's, it's a really nice kind of, um, kind of brain puzzle, like I could, screen print all the wallpaper and control everything from day one. And I actually have a crafts background, and that sort of is how you're trained as a, as a crafts person. But I didn't want to do that. I wanted to, I, I really like the challenge. And Bellingrad told, kind of taught me that to enjoy the challenge of the unknown and sort of having to collaborate with the material a little bit. Uh, because there is an element of surprise where you don't know where it's going to go. You know, you have an idea, but you don't really get to see it until it's done. Um, and I know some artists hate this, but I'm definitely one of those artists that really needs to not be able to know exactly what's going to happen to want to see it through. When I know too much about where it's, you know, if I build a model and it looks just like the model, it's great, it's satisfying, but I, there's not, I don't really learn anything and I don't get to problem solve along the way. It's just not as much fun of a process for me. Um, and that sort of, like having enough knowledge to n know what you need to know and to plan enough so it's not completely just improvised from day one, but also being able to let go enough to have that life in the work through the dialogue. So I think it does add a sort of life to the work a little bit because you can actually see the thought process happening when you look at it which I, I think is really important. I tend to really like work a lot better when I can sort of see a little bit of how the artist was thinking as they're making it. Um, so this piece, much better over here, just laser pointing at that wall now, is the, the chair. And um, I originally just set it up in my studio. I was doing something else with the chair. Uh, I, the first aim was to cut all the pattern out. And I don't have a slide, but you can just turn around and see it. Uh, and uh, concentrate all the pattern that I removed from the chair into a sort of tapestry or blanket or rug or how, however big it could get. And uh, so that was my aim. And then it wound up being the color of all the stuff that was on my wall, or the same kind of tone. So I started playing with that and put it in front of the tone. And so this piece really came from that open-mindedness and, and sort of improvisation with looking around my studio and, oh, that looks really great with that other thing. And I'm not showing that installation right now, so I might as well photograph the two together and see what happens and see what it looks like. And, um, 
I know you're not all maybe going into fine arts perhaps, but I think having that openness and ability to kind of improvise and think on your feet is really important in everything. It's not just art that that's important. Um, and I use, I also apply that to this work, the um, heirloom series. So heirloom, like heirloom china, um, you know, wedding china things. I actually have a piece, I'll show you in a second, that I did where I did cut up somebody's wedding china that they gave me. Uh, but sort of taking all of the pattern out, I do still have the pattern. I haven't turned it into anything yet. Um, but really pushing the delicacy of these pieces. And originally the reason I made these was to actually figure out how to get the sort of spirit of the Keeping Up Appearances series in an object that I could ship around and show when it wasn't a big production every time I wanted to show it. Um, and a few curators really responded to those you know, isolated pieces in that first installation. So I made this series of porcelain and it's growing. I have so many pieces now. Um, this one is the sort of star uh, called Spit Cake. So it's uh, referencing cake on a spit, which is a kind of wedding cake. It, there's different names for it, but it's in Eastern Europe all over the place. It's a wedding cake, but it's actually a cake made on a roasted spit, which is fascinating. Uh, and I saw the first one in Brittany, but I couldn't, you have to buy the whole cake to eat it, so I still don't know what it tastes like, because I didn't want to eat this like two foot cake by myself. Uh, but this is 40 pieces of china. So this is actually somebody's wedding china that they gave me, because they were purging a lot of the stuff they aren't, weren't using, and said, you know, you'll celebrate this and honor it and not just put it in goodwill. So uh, I turned it into this piece. And you know, I really love, I actually do all this by hand. I do all of this by hand. I've laser cut a few things in the talk early on, but I really like that the mistakes are part of the piece. If something breaks, I have to figure out how to use it. Um, if the tool wanders, I keep going. So it's not a very kind of cold, predictable pattern around the thing. And you know, for, actually for this one, I went the wrong way. No? Yeah? Yeah, it's gone. Uh, it disappeared, whatever. For this one, I'll go back to this one. This one actually broke in a few pieces. I, I dropped it in the, I have to cut it in a water bath and I, I didn't drop it on the floor, luckily, but I dropped it in the water bath and it broke in a few pieces. And so instead of, you know, getting upset and throwing it out, I said, okay, so, how do I turn this into another piece? And so I took out some sort of gum tack and um, pieced it together in different ways and took photos and figured out how it worked. But uh, I think a lot of you also as artists need to sort of learn how to see what happens next. We'll have to learn how to do that, respond if something doesn't go the way you expect. You know, do you embrace it or do you freak out and throw it out and, you know, have to start over and sometimes it's more work to try to fix it and sometimes it's fun to sort of, now I'm not tied to it. If I break it more, it's, it wasn't great anyway. So, you know, how do I make it work for me? So I'm going to sort of end on a series of landscapes that I'm doing. So kind of going back to Bellingrath and doing this sort of one-to-one, -one, you know, cutting something and directly mirroring it or, you know, um, using the whole animal. I don't know if you've caught on that, but everything I do, I use all the parts. I have to figure out how to use all the parts. If I cut up a roll of wallpaper, I have to use the whole roll of wallpaper. I had to use the whole book, you know, and it gives me a really good challenge of, okay, so I have to see this through. I can't just fall in love with it halfway through, but also I can't keep going. It gives me a very finite end time, which I'm not great with. I'll keep making things forever. I'll keep working on the same piece forever. Um, so this is a landscape. This is a 14-foot long collage called Italian Gardens. Uh, this flower was from the book, and these didn't work in the collage, so they're their own thing. But this was all, the, all the parts are in the thing. So instead of having the abstract and landscape and then the isolated concentrated material, because it was all black and white, it didn't make sense to do that. I, um, I actually just turned everything around and sort of turned it into this landscape. Uh, but it was a really fun way to play with, 
you know, lining up different patterns and images to make this sort of almost convincing wild space. I think of it almost like a wilderness space that uh, out of formal gardens, it's Italian formal gardens instead of British formal gardens, but um, out of formal gardens, which are highly organized, highly controlled spaces. And, you know, with Bellingrath, even with the domestic spaces, I really like kind of putting disorder into order. Um, and then this one is beef, chicken, or fish. This was uh, all food out of a food book of French cuisine. And it was, uh, and it's, again, like if you look at French cuisine, it's so bizarre. Like everything is stacked and perfect and, you know, made into these weird sculptures or baked in bread shaped like fish or, you know, it's good. they're all traditional dishes, but everything was like food that wasn't supposed to look like food, you know? So I cut it up and, and sort of played with that. But, you know, it's, it's all these sort of symbols of this like kind of other, like almost leisure or luxury that most people don't you know, deal with. We don't usually eat food that doesn't look like food. We like food that looks like food. Um, but I really like kind of playing with that highly organized, you know, kind of cold versions of nature, of domestic life, of, um, you know, just daily, our daily encounters with things, food, clothes, furniture, wallpaper, um, gardens. And then uh, lastly, the, um, you've probably all seen it's funny, these are like slightly bigger than what's behind this, but uh, the costume for the day series. So this, this dress was in the first Keeping Up Appearances piece, uh, but I was doing, I was sort of thinking again about how to kind of adapt some of this removal and, and um, condensing pattern into other materials or other languages and so I was thinking of party dresses and garments and things and sort of removing all the material all the pattern and then covering my face so I'm like exposing and concealing myself at the same time and you know what that sort of does and you know I think all of the sort of keeping up with the Joneses or fixing things that don't need to be fixed you know upward mobility all of those things are kind of doing this, you know, you're sort of masking yourself and exposing your, yourself at the same time. And, you know, I think everyone has a version of that. Um, I do, you <laughs> know, so. Uh, and then um, just to, f on the final note, the title of the show, I May Not Be a Lion, is actually a Queen Elizabeth I quote or a segment of a Queen Elizabeth I quote, which is, I may not be a lion, but I am a lion's cub and I have a lion's heart. And she was talking about, you know, she, her father wanted her to be a boy. And so, you know, sort of having to spend her whole life convincing people that it's okay, I can do the job, I'm great, you know, I'm not feeble. I, um, a great queen, and everyone actually really loved her in the end. But, you know, I think having this sort of connection with having to face how people see you, so, you know, having to, in some ways, having to kind of inflate your sense of self or prove people is a good thing, you know, and I, I really, that quote really resonates with me, you know, with all of this, this type of work. And, um, and my family is English, so I've had this kind of like funny obsession with the Queen anyway. <laughs> I grew up watching the Queen, you know, on TV, Queen Elizabeth, you know, uh, now. But uh, so I, I have a lot of sort of like nods to English culture, like with Hyacinth Bouquet and things like that throughout my work. But, um, but yeah, so I'll take questions. That's my talk.